Interesting times. And to talk a little more on China and the rest, I'm joined from Singapore by Grant Williams. He's the strategy advisor at Vulpi's Investment Hedge Fund and author of the investment newsletter, Things That Make You Go Hmm. Grant Williams, welcome to the program. Hi, Tiki. Hello. Now, how much store do you, do, or should we put in these latest Chinese manufacturing figures, do you think? Well, as with most Chinese figures, it depends which one you're talking about. You know, there are, there are, there are a couple of uh, PMI numbers that come out of China. There's the official one today, which came in at uh, 53.1, which was uh, a 12-month high and, and, and had a lot of uh, good numbers in it. But we had the H, uh, HSBC PMI number, which came in at a disappointing 48, uh, which was down. That's a four-month low. And there's some differences between the two. The, the HSBC one concentrates uh, very much from the bottom up, it looks a lot more at, uh, at some of the smaller businesses and some of the businesses that don't get uh, direct state funding, whereas the official one uh, concentrates a lot more on some of the state-owned enterprises, the bigger enterprises. So if you look at the two, there's a slightly larger sample size in the official number, and that's the one uh, a lot of people from overseas look at. But I think we have to pay attention to the HSBC number, which was, which was slightly more disappointing. It's, it's worth pointing out that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the official number has a slightly more um, sketchy record at uh, factoring in seasonal adjustments. Historically, the March number is 3% uh, higher than the uh, January and February numbers, which is when Chinese New Year comes in. So as mm. with all numbers in China, there's no cut and dried number. All right. Well, aside from these numbers, we've also now got this growing political tension in China. Uh, we've got a closing down of websites and blogs and talk even of coups. How serious is all this? Well, it's a very difficult thing to do to look at China you know, through a Western eye. I mean, the microblogging sites have become phenomenally popular in China, and they've been allowed to uh, proliferate to the point where we saw you know, last week they've become a slight problem. Now, they've closed them down um, for three days to, to delete and clear up any, uh, any messages that the, 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 the government aren't too happy with. And that's, I think they reckon 200,000 messages have been deleted. We've had 16 sites closed down. We've had six people arrested for, for posting what have been deemed to be uh, you know, inflammatory remarks on the internet. So they're an important tool, but they will be allowed to uh, be as important as the, as the government are happy with them. And any time there's a problem, as we've seen now, they're going to get uh, stamped down fairly, fairly quickly. And so do you think it's going to have any sort of impact on the economy more broadly? I don't think that's particularly going to have a, a major effect. Obviously, we're, we're in an election year in China, which don't come along as often as, uh, as other countries, and it's a very, very important thing for them. They will do everything they can to ensure as much stability as possible between now and October when, when, we, when we hand over. And this, uh, these goings on in, in, in Chongqing with, uh, with Bo Xilai being ousted, who was a very, very senior member of the party, and his pedigree was uh, mm. impeccable. That's the kind of instability that the Chinese do not like, uh, especially in a year like this. So there's a lot of people focusing on that, and they should do. But realistically, we never really know what's going on. What we do know is some very important people uh, have been pushed out, and that, that's, a, that's a very big sign of weakness from China and something that we're looking to uh, smooth over as quickly as they can. All right. Well, let me throw over to uh, Europe. And, of course, we've got another half a billion euros now available to fight fires through 2013. But I just see this morning in Europe we're reeling now, the markets are reeling from Eurozone unemployment data, a 25-year high to 10.8% in February, 17 million people out of work now. Yes, and, and that's clearly a, a big problem. I mean, everyone knows the numbers in Greece uh, are very high. Everyone knows the numbers in Spain, Portugal are very, very high. But, you know, today we had Italy at a uh, 17-year high, I think. And the unemployment is clearly a problem. Also, we had Eurozone PMI numbers out, and that's uh, below 50, which uh, sig signals a contraction. So, you know, with every good number, um, it, it's great. There's a lot of people cheering those good numbers when they come out. But we haven't seen a broad enough uh, selection of, of decent numbers to suggest that this recovery is, is self-sustaining. So numbers like unemployment are very, very important, and 25-year highs do not play well. Also, I've heard we've, we've got big banks like BNP Paribas, Socgen, even banks in Italy and Spain said that say that saying that they're going to repay most of the money they've borrowed, these, this cheap three-year money under the LTRO, in less than 12 months. They're going to pay it back. Is that likely? 
Well, look, if, if things pick up and if business is booming, absolutely, I'm sure, I'm sure they will. But the problem is we've seen already you know, when they took these loans down, a lot of that money went straight back on deposit with the ECB. So I think when you lend people money uh, and they have control of it, they'll pay it back when they're good and ready. It's fine to come out now and say we're going to pay it back in a year, but if in 11 months' time their financial situation and the overall financial situation of the market has changed, they're going to hang on to the money once they've got it, I promise you. Mm. And we've also got with this, this new uh, combining of funds, combining the EFSF with, with the uh, European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, it's been said that this should have uh, a greater level of control over decisions to, to fund anything because it needs um, unanimous vote from members as opposed to the ECB, which just needed a majority vote. Do you think there's going to be more control over the kitty now? If, if you ask me, there's going to be less. Anytime you need a, uh, a unanimous decision out of Europe, as we've seen in the past 12 months, it's a, it's a very, very difficult thing to pull off. I mean, a majority decision is one thing, but if you need any kind of unanimous decision from 17 countries, uh, all with different uh, metrics, all with a different angle on the outcome, it's going to be a very, very tricky thing for them to pull off, I have to say. All right. All right. doesn't get any easier, does it? Grant Williams, thank you very much for joining us. It doesn't, no. Thanks, Dickie.